Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Bible story tonight. Thank you because you have granted us the peace of mind and also the safe tree over here to have the Bible study. Thank you for your protection upon every one of your children. And thank you, Lord, for these great truths you are revealing to us. We pray, Lord, you'll do good in our lives in Jesus' name. We're asking, Lord, that tonight you reveal your very mind in the scriptures to every one of us so that, Lord, what you have inspired to be written by your spirit, you'll implant and press upon our hearts and we'll live like you want us to live. And the righteousness of Christ, the righteousness by faith, will come into every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Inward righteousness, incorruptible righteousness, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. That Lord in your sight will have innocence, will have integrity. Our lives will bring glory to you in Jesus' name. Keep us awake at a large as we study your word and read together. Bless your people, Lord, today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We come to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, which we have been looking at for some time, we're looking at verses 19 and 20, important verses of scripture. And these verses come out of what we call the Sermon on the Mount, that is the Sermon, the message that Jesus Christ, our Lord, Savior, and Redeemer gave on that mountain in Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 here are the words whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven for I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Those are the words of Jesus Christ, important words for us to take to heart, important words for us to learn. What do they mean? And what does the Lord want to pass across to us? Let's see, for example, at the end of verse 19, it talks about the kingdom of heaven. At the end of verse 20, it talks about the kingdom of heaven. When you read the Gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll discover the use of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And those uh, terms are used interchangeably, synonymously. That means sometimes it's called the kingdom of heaven. Other times it's called the kingdom of God. And Jesus Christ spoke about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, a lot of times before his death. And then after his death, when he rose from the dead, he continued speaking to the people about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Come back to that Matthew chapter 5 verse 20 again. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed, shall go beyond, shall be greater than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case, in no wise, enter into the kingdom of heaven in matthew chapter 6 verse 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness you see now about the kingdom of god and the kingdom of heaven the same thing seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you he's telling us not to put the cart before the horse it's telling us to put the first thing in the first place. Make the main thing the main thing. Don't pursue the subsidiary. And don't pursue the unimportant. Don't leave the eternal and then seek after the temporary. You know many people are seeking after all these other things. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Where with that shall we be closed? 
How are we going to have the normal, physical, natural, temporary blessings? The Lord says, leave that alone. And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then he said, all these things shall be added unto you. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He comes back now using those same terms or the term, the kingdom of heaven. And you can see the preoccupation of his heart. You can see the emphasis of his message, the kingdom of heaven. That people will know that that is the most important thing and see how to enter. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. In Mark chapter 1 verse 14, he begins to tell us now to enter into that kingdom. What we're to do? What part we're to play to enter into that kingdom? Mark chapter 1 verse 14, he tells us now, after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, the same thing. And he came now preaching the kingdom of God, saying and saying, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is sat and very near. Repent ye and believe the gospel. And now begins to explain to us how to enter into that kingdom. How to become citizens of that kingdom. Number one, repent. Number one, recognize that you are a sinner. Number one, recognize that your ways are not right in the sight of the Lord. Recognize that sin is deadly and dangerous and will bar, will close the kingdom, the doors of the kingdom against you. Therefore, turn around, change your mind, make a decision. And leave the broad way of sinning and come into the narrow way of obedience to the Lord. Repent and then believe. Believe the good news. Believe the glad tidings. Believe the gospel. Believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Believe the gospel. In Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 23. Mark chapter 10, verse 23. And Jesus looked round about and says unto, the, unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Kingdom of God. How tough it is for the rich to enter into the kingdom of God. You know, sometimes uh, when you hear that all these great men, rich men, popular men, exalted men, that they are running to houses of worship. You think that the standard of the world has changed. It has suddenly become very easy for the rich to get into the king. No, they can get into church. They can get into religion. If they're going to get into the kingdom of God, it's going to take repentance. And how tough, how hard it is for a rich man who has amassed his wealth by dubious means, by cheating and stealing from the government, by hiding things away from the people that will discover how they got their riches, how hard it is. Or for the people that put their riches in some banks and then they have other names written as the owners of those accounts. And they never tell the truth. And they don't want to tell the truth how hard it is for them. That stole from Paul and Peter. That stole from government and corporations. That stole from poor people and other people to amass wealth to get into the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus Christ was not gathering a crowd. He was telling them the truth. Because it was truth personified. And he told the rich the truth. And he told the poor the truth. He told everyone the truth. Jesus cried the truth, the way and the life. He tells us that verse 23. He looked round about. 
He must have been looking at the faces of the people there. Yes, I know that one, he appears rich. I know that other one, he appears rich. You know, he knew the name of Zacchaeus, even without Zacchaeus telling him his name. And he knew how Zacchaeus got his riches. And he looked at that woman over there, that rich woman, and he says, hmm, how hardly shall it be for them that have riches to get into the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and says unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in their riches? They don't trust Christ. They don't trust the blood of the Lamb. They don't trust the way of the cross. They don't trust the plan of redemption. They trust in their riches. Will buy things for them. Will make contacts for them. Will make life easy for them. They trust in their riches. Are they sick? The money is there to do the operation. Do they have any sorrow? The money is there to go and relax. And it says it's going to be hard for them that trust in their riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. You see how many times he mentions the kingdom of God here. And they were astonished out of measure. It blew their minds. That get you into the kingdom of God is, uh, is, is of great, great price. And Jesus said, yes, that's the way it is. The kingdom of God is so high and so exalted and so precious that it's going to take a lot to enter into that kingdom. That's why it says, except your righteousness shall exceed. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of God heaven and they were astonished out of measure beyond measure saying among themselves who then can be saved and jesus looking upon them says with men this is impossible but not with god for with god all things are possible and do you see the connection now with God? All things are possible. With God, all things are possible. Actually, the connection, the context is not talking about opening the eyes of the blind. You know, whenever we're having crusade and people want to say, encourage other people that they can get healed and delivered. Or they say, with God, all things are possible. What he's saying is, with God, all things are possible. He can soften the minds of the rich. He can turn the minds of the rich. He can turn it around. He can turn their confidence and trust away from their riches. He can remove the love of money away from their hearts and make them to cling to the cross. And then know that the way of the cross leads home. That's what it means when it says, with men, this is impossible. It will appear that nobody can be saved among the rich people. But with God, all things are possible. He can crush the idol of riches in their hearts and still bring them into the kingdom. We're looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 59. Luke chapter 9, verse 59. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach. The kingdom of God. Preach the kingdom of God. Tell them there is a kingdom. God is preparing a kingdom. And you need to strive to be there. Strive to enter in while you, while you may. And go and preach that kingdom. And tell them the same thing. I've been telling them how to get into the kingdom. And they were told in verse 61. Another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell. Which are at home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his son to the plow, and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. You had the message yesterday in your various locations and districts, and I was reminding you that we don't believe what they call eternal security. That he is once saved, always saved. 
once in the kingdom, always in the kingdom. I was reminded you yesterday that we don't believe that the Bible doesn't teach that. And yet Jesus Christ is saying, no man, having put his son to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We need to be steady and steadfast in the kingdom. Remain in the kingdom. Abide in me and let my words abide in you. It's when the word of God is abiding you. You continue in my word indeed. Then are you my disciples and then are you going to last and remain in the kingdom. In Luke chapter 13 verse 23. Luke chapter 13 verse 23. Then said one unto him, Lord... Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Many shall seek to enter in at the late hour. Like the foolish virgins. They will seek to enter in at their own time. Wanting to fulfill their own condition. Lord, wait for me. I'm not ready yet to repent. Do it now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call your pony while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way. And your righteous man is thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And then he will abundantly pardon. He will forgive him. Strive to enter in at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying lord lord open unto us and he shall answer and say unto you i know you not when ye are then shall ye begin to say we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not, when ye are uh, depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. That's it, the kingdom of God, and ye yourselves thrust out. It's not every religious person that will get into the kingdom. It's not every bench warmer in every church that will get into the kingdom. That's why it says, strive to enter in while you may. It tells us in John chapter 3 verse 3 and verse 5. John chapter 3. Reading from verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This thing must be very important. It's in Matthew, it's in Mark, it's in Luke, it's in John. All the records of the message of Christ, they show us that he emphasized the kingdom. And he showed the people how to get into the kingdom. And he said, except him and be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered in verse 5, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except him and be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So very important. Make sure then that you are ready to enter. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1. At this time now Jesus had been crucified. He had died. He had been buried then on the third day. He rose from the dead. After that resurrection, he appeared before his own disciples. And then what was he talking about during those 40 days period? That he had risen from the dead and revealing himself to his own disciples. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 1, the former treatise of I made O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them for three days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And that was the emphasis. That was the priority. Always speaking about the kingdom of God. And in the passage we're looking at today, Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break 
one of these least commandments and shall teach men so it shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven everything is related to the kingdom of heaven the kingdom of god what we do what we say what we teach what influence we have and the things we plan and the decisions we make and the direction we go in life we shall relate everything tie up everything to the kingdom of god and then he goes on in the middle of that verse 19 but whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven for i say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees well, this is telling them one thing. The Pharisees were there, and the Sadducees were there, and the scribes were there. And he was telling them, you Pharisees and Sadducees, your righteousness will not take you to heaven. How about if you were standing in the front of a preacher, and then he looks at you, and he says, hey, scribe, your righteousness is not sufficient yet for the kingdom. Pharisee. Your righteousness is not sufficient yet. Those people thought they had made it already. They were proud of their righteousness. And he blew their balloon. He punched everything. And he told them, you're not yet ready. You must have something greater than this, deeper than this, higher than this, broader than this. You must have the internal righteousness. If you're going to get into the kingdom, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and pharisees ye shall in no case no way you can get into the kingdom the door will shut will be shut against you automatically you can you will in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven the Lord then talks about the importance of righteousness and then he was going to bring the people to understand what it means to actually have this kind of righteousness. We're going to divide the study to three parts tonight. Number one, exclusion of the unrighteous from God's kingdom. The exclusion of the unrighteous from God's kingdom. Number two, the exaltation of the righteous in God's kingdom. The exaltation. One, they are in time. Two, they are exalted. And three, they are rewarded in that kingdom. The exaltation of the righteous in God's kingdom. Number three, external righteousness insufficient for God's kingdom. Let's come back to number one. The exclusion of the unrighteous from God's kingdom. Let's look at the language of Jesus Christ here. We're coming back to Matthew chapter 5 verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments. Think about that. The least of the commandments. The least of the commandments. If you have been to, you know, some historic churches before you were born again, before you came here, you'll know that uh, some of those uh, churches, they divide sins into two parts. The venial sins and the mortal sins. The ones that are very, very serious in their mind. And the one that they feel, this one is nothing. This one is not serious. Some sins they say, this one is of little or no consequence. Other sins they say, this one is weighty. This one is heavy. This one is terrible. How could anybody do that? That's how they, how they divide the commandments of the Lord. Venial sins and then those mortal sins. And you see there are people, even if they don't go to church, there are some people that do some things and say, this is nothing, this is nothing. Look at Proverbs chapter 20, verse 14. Proverbs chapter 20, we're looking at verse 14. It is not, it is not, says the buyer, but when he is gone his way, then he boasts. When doing it, he says, but it's nothing, it's nothing. Are you counting this serious? 
This is the least of the commandments. This is of no consequence. This is of little consequence. It is nothing. It is nothing. He says when you are with him. And then after he is gone, he said, you know, I slapped the man. I blindfolded him. I deceived him. And then he's boasting because he thinks what he has done is nothing. And the Lord Jesus Christ is saying, all those things you say they are nothing, they'll debar you from getting to the kingdom of God. And then he tells us in Proverbs chapter 15, Proverbs chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 21, Proverbs 15, 20, Folly is joy to him that is destitute of wisdom, foolishness, folly, sin, is joy to him that is destitute of divine wisdom. He categorizes the commandments of God and he says, this is nothing, that is nothing, that is nothing. And because he does that, and that's why the Lord is saying, he's excluded from the kingdom of God. He will not get into the kingdom. In Proverbs chapter 14, verse 9. Proverbs 14, verse 9. Fools make a mock at sin. Fools make light of sin. They say, this is nothing. This is not serious. This is one of the least of the commandments. And then Jesus said in that Matthew chapter 5 verse 19. Whosoever therefore, whosoever. Have you noticed that? Whosoever in our church here will say that means anybody and everybody. It means pastor. It means group coordinator. It means overseer. It means the father and the mother. It means the worker. It means the member. It means the man or the woman. It means the young. It means the old. Jesus said, whosoever. And then you cannot segregate yourself, isolate yourself, and put yourself in a special class. No, the word of God doesn't concern me. And the word of God doesn't touch me. It concerns you. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of the least of these commandments and teach men so. How does a person break the commandment of God and then teach other people so? One, when you commit sin publicly with impunity, you're teaching other people to do the same. When you come out in the open and you know that this is the word of God and deliberately you break that commandment in the, in the presence of other people, you are breaking the commandment of God and you are teaching men so. When you, a father, the creditor is coming and he wants to get his money and then you say, well, I don't have the money, what am I going to do? And then you tell your child... Tell that man coming, daddy is not at home. You are breaking the commandment of God and you are teaching others so. You are excluded from the kingdom of God. A mother. When you go into worldliness and then by your worldly example, you influence your daughter to do that. You are teaching others so. When you break the commandments of God, love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man, if any woman loves the world, the love of the father is not in him, is not in her. And you break that commandment of God. And then you bring that thing to church. And you sit in a very conspicuous place to demonstrate and to reveal that this is who I am. Whatever you are going to preach, preach. Whatever you are going to say, say. We're not afraid of preaching. We're not afraid of the Bible. Here we are. When you publicize your disobedience and your sinning like that, you teach other people so. You teach your daughters. You teach the young converts in the church. When you do something openly that is disobedient to the word of God. And then when you do it repeatedly, until it becomes a habit, it's difficult to break. And other people see that that is becoming, that is a pattern. 
And then you are a respected man of God in quotes. There are men of God that will not get to the kingdom of God. And then you are a respected woman of God in quotes. There are women of God that will not get to the kingdom of God. And they say that if the man of God can do that, if the woman of God can do that, how about me? I'm just a new convert. When by your example, you mislead or you lead astray those new converts you break the commandments of God and you teach men so and Jesus said if that is the case you're going to be excluded from the kingdom of God maybe you don't understand the language when it says in uh, Matthew chapter 5 verse 19 whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments not, and the Lord was not even talking of the great the things to think are great, like killing a person, like robbing the bank, like joining a gang of occultic people. Just the little, little things Jesus said, whosoever. You know, there's no favoritism in the kingdom of God. God is no respecter of persons. When we get to heaven, you'll discover there's no coordinator there. There's no group coordinator there. You'll discover when we get to heaven that all these great, great titles, Archbishop, General Superintendent, General Overseer, you'll not find those titles there. God is not concerned with title. He's concerned with holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And therefore he said, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. What does that mean? He shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. There are some people that will say, well, if I'll be the least in the kingdom, at least I will enter. You don't understand. It's just the use, you know, the Greek language, the way they use the Greek and the Hebrew language is different from the way we use the English language. And when they translate directly from the Greek into the English, you will miss the meaning. Let me show you. In 1 Samuel chapter 2. For Samuel chapter 2, you'll see a similar language and then you will understand the meaning, the implication of what Jesus Christ was saying. In, in for Samuel chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 30. Let me jump back to verse 29. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father shall walk before me forever but now the lord says that be far from me once again there's no eternal security i said before that your house and the house of your father will walk before me forever but now that be far from me. Can you see that? Hey, that's not eternal security. That's conditional security. And now it says in that verse 30, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. But they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. If you don't understand the Hebrew language, you'll say, well, if I am esteemed, but lightly. That's okay, that's okay, that's all right. If I'm esteemed, but lightly. But you don't understand. Because it says in that verse 30, they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. What's the meaning? Go to verse 31. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm. And the arm of thy father's house, that's to be lightly esteemed. Now you understand. It means rejected, really. 
And then it says, and there shall not be an old man in thine house that's to be lightly esteemed. And thou shalt see an enemy in mine habitation that's being lightly esteemed. And in all, all the wells which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. That's what we like to esteem. Now you understand the language when it says, what we call the least in the kingdom of God. That is, they'll say, is very far away. The, the meaning is this. Can you look up here? If you are here, and somebody is very close by, you see him at full length. You see him, the posture but when it's very very far away like when you are in an aeroplane and then you climb so high and the fellow is there so far on the ground is the least in posture it diminishes in value it diminishes in stature you are up there and you look down so far away and it's very very small like an ant when you are in the kingdom of God and this fellow because he broke the commandments of God and he taught other people to break the commandments of God is far away from the kingdom of God and then you look at him the kingdom of God is up there very high and then you look at him it's on the other side is very small shall be called look at that fellow he's so small is the least i've never found anything so small like that before it's outside the kingdom and that's the greek language that's the meaning the implication of the greek language come back to matthew chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 19 whosoever therefore whosoever whosoever Hey, you know, sometimes uh, hey, when you've been in church for 20 years, for 30 years, you think now you have a special license to break the commandments of God. When you have these big titles, these great titles, you take some license and liberty. And you say that the way I am, I think now I should be able to see it. And I should be able to choose which commandments to obey and which commandments not to obey. I hope that, you know, these preachers are not expecting that those of us who have been here for these 20, 30 years, I hope they are not preaching the same thing to us. I hope they understand that we have the liberty to break some of the least commandments. That liberty, that life says, will lead you away from the kingdom. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. When you break the commandments of God and you influence other people to break that same commandment. And you teach other people to break those commandments. And you encourage other people to break those commandments. And then you are hardening their conscience. You are blurring their vision. You are, you are removing their conviction. They will not know the difference between right and wrong anymore. Because they count you as an authority. And then that kind of manifestation of authority will lead you into hell. Whosoever, high or low, young or old, youth or children, a mother or a father, a pastor or a leader, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men so. You know, when you get into a place of work, when you get to that place of work, it's like you are, you are all ready to work. And you are running here and running there. And you are picking this and picking that. The old timers in that place of work will say, young man, come on here. What's happening to you? You are working for the government and you are spending all your energy and you are sweating on the work. What's the matter with you? Slow down. Keep cool. We don't work in the government like that. We hide the files under the desk. 
and we do it this way and do it this way. Those people who have been there before you, they are breaking the commandment of God on the ethics of the work and they are teaching men so. The same thing when people come to church. Those who are just coming, when they hear the word of God and they want to put this right and put this right and settle this and settle that, then some of the people that have been in church for a long time might say, what's that mean to you? Just because of what the pastor preached yesterday, then you are rising up and doing this and doing that. We don't do it like that. That's how the pastor talks. And we've had something more serious than that before. And we still live the way we live. And then you cool down the passion, the consecration, and the conviction, and the fire in the heart of that young fellow. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. When you are breaking the commandments of God and you're teaching other people to break the commandments of God by your encouragement to do evil, by your influence or example to do evil, you exclude yourself from the kingdom of God. In Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 21. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He that doeth, not he that knoweth, not he that memorizes, not he that carries a big Bible, not he that answers questions on Sunday, not he that even evangelizes and teaches other people, he that doeth, the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, prayer warriors. And you know, sometimes uh, some of these activities in church can deceive us. And we can then substitute obedience to the word of God with the prayer. With spiritual warfare, with casting out devils, with having crusades, with having all this effectiveness, these people coming, laying hands on them and praying for them and making them to have what you call miracle. But Jesus said, Many will say to me, not a few, but many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I've cast out devils, and in thy name I've done many wonderful works. Then when I profess unto them, I never knew you. Is that possible? Jesus said, yes. That a person can cast out devils, can do many wonderful works, and can be exalted in the church, in religious circles, as an effective man, woman, or prayer. And yet a secret sin and secret iniquity. And Jesus said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. How important then that we should make sure that we, we come to the study and then we come with a heart to get to the kingdom of God so that all these religious activities will not exclude us from the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're looking at verse 9. Here it tells us in this verse 9. It's telling us what, what you know. And then he's surprised. Don't you know this? Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't you understand that unrighteousness will debar you, will block your way into the kingdom of God? Don't you understand? You know, sometimes you want to go for uh, an interview. 
And you thought, you know, you, you thought, I have that shirt there. And it's white and clean. And then as you pick up the shirt, although every part is white, there's an obvious stain. And it's a little spot. And it's a little stain. But it's visible. And that little stain, that little spot, disqualifies that shirt. You cannot put it on. Because it will be so obvious to the people interviewing you that you didn't really prepare yourself. You didn't really get ready for the interview. The shirt... 99% of the shirt, if you look at the coverage area, 99% is white and clean. And less than 1% of that shirt has a stain. And that each little stain or spot then disqualifies that shirt. Maybe your life is all right in this area and this area and this area, but... There's that little sin, that dirty habit, that dirty lifestyle, a stain, a sport, that you need to take that life, that heart, back to the fountain of the blood of the Lamb so that you can be totally washed and cleansed and then you are brought back into the kingdom. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Don't let any false doctrine deceive you. Don't let any false teacher deceive you. Don't let the kind of religious activities you have in the Christian fold deceive you. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall have, shall inherit the kingdom of God. I pray God will open our eyes and God will help us to flee all these things and to be clean, to be washed and to become whiter than snow. Revelation chapter 21. In Revelation chapter 21, I'm reading to you from verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and all mongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death verse 27 and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth Neither whatsoever walketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And then in chapter 22, chapter 22, I'm reading from verse 15. And without outside the kingdom are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie we go to point number two exaltation the exaltation of the righteous in god's kingdom matthew chapter 5 we're looking at the second part of verse 19 matthew chapter 5 reading from verse 19 but whosoever shall do and teach them. Stop there for a moment. Whosoever shall do and teach. Whosoever shall do and teach. Not just to do it. You know, there are some, there are some parents that will say, children, live your life. Be free. You're still young. Don't follow me. I happen to be going to deeper life. 
And I know it's a challenge for even those of us who are adults to keep away from all these uh, pressures of life. But you are still young. Therefore, go to any place you want to go. You do, but you don't teach. Whosoever shall do and teach. Oh, mothers. Yes, my daughter. I know that you know the way I dress. I'm a mother already. I'm not looking for, you know, your daddy is my husband. I can dress like this. What does it matter? I'm an adult. You are still a teenage girl. And therefore, even I do it this way, I give you your liberty. Don't copy me. You do, but you don't teach. Whosoever shall do and teach. Whatever you do that will take you to the kingdom of God, pass it on. Teach your children the same thing, the same conviction, the same doctrine, the same lifestyle. Whosoever shall do and teach. You know, those things are connected. Look at Mark chapter 6 verse 30. Mark chapter 6 verse 30. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. Do and teach. What they did and what they taught. Those things are important. The doing and the teaching. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former treatise of I made of Theophilus of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And have you noticed the doing comes before the teaching? Both to do and teach. You do it first. You practice it first. You leave it out first. And then you must teach it. Influence other people. Reproduce your conviction in other people. Reproduce that righteousness in other people. Reproduce the faithfulness and the loyalty in other people. Do and teach. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4 verse 9. Philippians chapter 4. We're reading from verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. What you have seen in me, that's what I do. And then what you have learned, that's what I teach. Look at everything. What I do and what I teach. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're reading from verse 10. It says over here, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, that's what I teach, and manner of life, that's what I do. Timothy, you have known, you have fully known my manner of life, my lifestyle, my character, my behavior, and then the doctrine, what I teach. Both must go together. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. Ezra chapter 7. We're reading from verse 10. And let's see the way Ezra committed himself. Into doing and teaching. Ezra chapter 7 verse 10. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. And to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. To do it first and then to teach in Israel the statutes and the doctrine, the statutes and the judgments. Uh, that means then, if you're really going to be valuable in the kingdom of God, if you're going to enter and remain and stay, in the kingdom of God, you do and you teach. Your consecration is not just to be a teacher, a preacher. Your consecration is to be a doer. A doer and then a teacher. You do it and then you teach it. 
And these are the people that will get into the kingdom. And these are the people that will be exalted and rewarded in the kingdom. In Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, reading from verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I thought Jesus had said that already. Disciples, didn't you hear? Were you not there in Matthew chapter 5? Disciples, why are you still asking a question like that? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I thought Jesus made that clear already. Matthew, I thought you were taking notes. Matthew, I thought you had already reached it down. Why didn't you tell the rest of the disciples, whosoever shall do and teach the least of these commandments, he shall be the greatest in the kingdom. Why don't you tell one another? Why don't we share together? We've covered that part of the syllabus before. We've touched it before. It takes righteousness to get into the kingdom. And if we remind ourselves what we learned before, we'll not be asking this question at this time again. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? But all the same, it gave Jesus Christ another chance to be able to teach these disciples what they ought to know. And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily, I say unto you, except ye be converted. You see, that conversion is necessary. Repentance is necessary. Regeneration is indispensable. A new heart, a new life, a new spirit is very important. Except ye be converted and become as little children. Ye shall not enter. You're even asking about who will be the greatest. Let's talk about how to enter first. And except you are converted. Except you are transformed. And become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I pray we will enter. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17. Romans chapter 14. Reading from verse 17. Still talking about the kingdom. And what is the emphasis in the kingdom? The character of the people in the kingdom. The lifestyle of the people in the kingdom. In Romans chapter 14 verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. This is the kingdom of God. Righteousness. That's how to enter into the kingdom. That's how to remain in the kingdom. Righteousness. Peace. Peace in your heart. Peace with your wife. If you cannot be at peace with the closest person to you, and every little thing in the family irritates you, and the wife is like a prisoner, suffering, no peace, there's fire burning in the heart, hotter than the one in the kitchen, no peace. How are you going to get into the kingdom, woman? If your husband stays away in the place of work and is not eager to come home because there is no peace at home, let me stay more in the place of work and avoid the nagging and avoid the chewing. This woman will chew you, you know, chew your name and chew your life and chew your peace in her mouth. If your husband is staying back in the place of work and is afraid to come back home 
And every time, the nearer she gets to the house, she says, I hope this woman will be in good mood. I hope that today I'll be able to have some rest. If your home is like that, then you are not in the kingdom yet. Because the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When we come near you, when you come near us and we interact together, there should be joy. But if our coming nearer together takes our joy away, and then you are afraid of a child of God so-called child of God you're afraid of a member of the church you're afraid of coordinator because the coordinator is not a man of peace not a man of joy and when you get near you say I don't know you might blow my head today it might show me that you know I'm less than a worm and you're always afraid that's not the kingdom the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's why it says in verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. And the things wherewith one may edify another edification as we interact together that's what makes us to know we're in the kingdom and we love the kingdom and want to stay in the kingdom this is how to remain in the kingdom and this is how to become exalted in the kingdom the kingdom of god is only for the righteous only the righteous are for the kingdom of god the righteous are those who have been forgiven and cleansed by god through faith in christ they are made righteous and they obtain righteousness by faith. Having received the grace of God, they live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. They live by faith, the faith of the Son of God, and they, they delight themselves in the law of God. This is the righteous. He has a relationship with God which is anchored on grace and established by faith. His supreme desire is to love God more truly and keep his commandments wholeheartedly. His desire is to see others to love God truly and to keep his commandments faithfully. It grieves him to the depths of his heart. When he sees anyone breaking the law of God, violating the kingdom of the word of God and disobeying the laws of God. If you're a real child of God and a citizen of the kingdom of God, when other people break the commandment of God, you're not going to be cheering them, congratulating them, exalting them, promoting them, encouraging them in any way. It breaks your heart when people do not obey the, the word of God. You do not rejoice in other people doing things that are contrary to the will the mind of god psalm 119 in psalm 119 i'm reading to you there from verse 136 psalm 119 verse 136 rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law rivers of waters run down mine eyes because they keep not thy law when you see people that break the commandments of god it breaks your heart anyone breaking the law is breaking your heart it's like a dagger in your soul it pierces you to the very marrow of your heart in psalm 119 verse 158 158 it says, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. I beheld the transgressors and I was grieved because they kept not thy word. Hey, those are the people that are referred to as the righteous. He has joy only when divine nature reproduces righteousness in men and women around him. He lives for God's glory and teaches others the same. As he delights in God, God also delights in him. His is the kingdom. He shall be great in the kingdom of God. Let's come to point number three. External righteousness insufficient 
for God's kingdom. We're coming to Matthew chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 20. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. For verily I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven, except your righteousness shall go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no case, in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know those Pharisees, they publicized their righteousness everywhere. But it was nothing more than feel the rags. Just external righteousness. And there's still some people like that today. All their righteousness is that they don't have beard. All their righteousness is that they always cut their ear clean. All their righteousness is that if they are ladies, they wear their scarf every time. All their righteousness is that they don't use lipsticks, but they have anger. There's no lipstick, there is anger. They don't have jewelry. That's all the righteousness. The righteousness that is external. But the anger is inside. The bitterness is inside. Even the adultery is inside. She is still second woman in the home of that man. But she doesn't wear jewelry. And she doesn't use high heel shoes. And she comes to church. And she pays her tithes regularly. And she goes to clean the local church, the district church. But internally, she's not living right. External righteousness is not enough to take us to heaven. And that's exactly what Jesus was impressing upon those Pharisees and was telling them. And he was warning the other people, the younger people who are there, the people who are not extra religious, over religious, over zealous, like the Pharisees and the scribes. He said, Look on here. Look at those Pharisees. They fast twice in the week, they give tithes of all that they possess. And they always take pride in, I'm not like these publicans. It says, don't copy them. They are not going to the kingdom. Except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Ye shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's look at this righteousness they were proud of. Matthew chapter 23. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 25. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within ye are full of extortion and excess. Outwardly, you look all right. Who will look at the way you dress and say you're not a Christian? But the heart is something else. In verse 27, want to you scribes some Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like white sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outside, but within, full of dead men's bones, and of all uncleanness. In verse 28, even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men. You appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. And the Lord is saying, is looking at the heart. And except your righteousness goes deep within. And is greater and higher than the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. He shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. Uh, look at Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record 
that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they've been ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. They're ignorant of God's requirement. They're ignorant of God's demand for inward purity, inward holiness, inward righteousness. And they were going about to establish and to promote, to publicize their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. I pray God will give us his own righteousness. Pure within and pure without. Pure in our conscience and pure in our character. Pure in our thoughts and pure in our actions. As our dresses are clean, that our hearts will be cleaner. As we don't use all these things of the world outwardly, that we don't have the practice and the principle of the world inwardly. There will be peace within and peace without. There will be purity in the heart and purity in the life. There will be cleanliness in the thought, in the motive, in the intention, in the decision, in the ambition, in the aspiration, as well as in all our action, outward and inward purity. That's what will take us to heaven. But you know, just this superficial sin. That they call Christian living. This superficial thing. That when you bump at them. Then you realize the anger is still bottled within. And the violence is still bottled within. And although they may not slap you with their hand. Because of outward righteousness. They lash you with the tongue. But you see, the Lord is saying, just the outward external righteousness will not make it. It's when the heart is pure and the soul is clean. And then your mind is to go to heaven. That's why you come here. You're not here because, you know, you could, have, you could get all these outward righteousness in other places. There are some other churches where they don't use jewelry, you know. There are some other churches where they don't use all these uh, flamboyant things. In, you know, there's churches are there. And those churches think that not using jewelry, they think that is sanctification. You came over here because that superficial, outward, external righteousness is not satisfactory. It's not going to take us to heaven. And then you get on your knees. And then you pour out your heart before the Lord. And you say, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God. And then put a right spirit within me. The stony heart take out of my flesh. And give me the heart of flesh. You, you say, Lord, I want to have the blessedness of those who are pure in heart. Because blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. I want to have that peace, the peace of God in my soul. The peace of God in my heart. That no matter what is happening around me, there will be peace within. The Spirit of God shedding abroad the peace in our heart. Following peace, therefore, with all men, whether they are boss conductors, or their landlords, whoever they are, whether they are troublemakers or peace lovers, following peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You want to make yourself, you want to come into the kingdom, you want to say, Lord, I brush every other thing aside. And all the external righteousness that I've been taking pride in, I push all that aside. Lord, tonight, what I need is this righteousness and inward holiness and purity. The righteousness of the saints. He'll do it for us. We're told in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 7. Revelation 19 verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Clean 
and white. Oh, that our thoughts will be clean and white. Oh, that our ve the de very depths of our soul will be clean and white. Oh, that our ambition, our aspiration will be clean and white. Oh, that our inward thoughts, our inward motives, what motivates us to do anything, it will not be to seek the praise of men, that the inward motives will be white and clean. Oh, that our secret lives when people are not there when believers are not there in our places of work our actions our behavior everything that we do in our home when church people are not there when your husband is not at home when your wife is not at home oh that your behavior will be clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints not the righteousness of the pharisees not the righteousness of the sadducees not the righteousness of the religious people external righteousness for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he said unto me right blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the lamb and he says unto me, these are the true saints of God. I pray you'll be there. Why don't you rise up and then tell the Lord, Lord, I want to be there. Lord, I must be there. That the Lord will touch your heart, will touch your soul, will touch your spirit. That you'll say, oh Lord, this is why I came. This is what I'm looking for. The righteousness of the saints. Not the righteousness of the Sadducees. Not the righteousness of the Pharisees. That one will take nobody anywhere. But you see the righteousness of the saints. In what righteousness? Heart righteousness. Heart purity. Let, let us examine ourselves before the Lord. Are you breaking the least of the commandments of God and teaching others so? Are you overlooking some of the commandments of God and teaching others so? Are you influencing the people that come to the district church to disregard the word of God? You are disregarding the word of God yourself and teaching others so? You are breaking the heart of the almighty God and you are teaching others so? You're crucifying Christ again. And you're teaching others so. You're making heaven sorrowful by sinning. Public sinning. And you're teaching others so. You're trampling the doctrines of the Bible. The doctrines of the word of God. Under your feet. And you're teaching others so. That you'll take you away from the kingdom of God. You're you are practicing worldliness and you're teaching others so. You're practicing violence. The life of Nineveh is your life and you're teaching others so. You're like Sodom and Gomorrah in your behavior, in your action. You are teaching others so. Those innocent ladies, innocent girls, innocent, innocent teenage girls that knew nothing of immorality. You are committing immorality and you are teaching teenagers so. That's hellfire for you. The hottest part of hellfire. And except you repent, you shall likewise perish. For whosoever, man or woman, for whosoever, a preacher or a pastor, for whosoever, overseer, group coordinator, or coordinator, district pastor, for whosoever shall break one of these least of the commandments of God and teach men so will be excluded from the kingdom of God. Why don't you then come before the Lord and say, Lord, I believe your word. I know your word is true. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall not pass away. And God is no respecter of persons. And God is not afraid of you. Whosoever shall break 
one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. You are breaking the word of God. You become flippant, careless, frivolous, jesting with the word of God. Not counting the word of God as serious anymore and teaching others so. A leader's sin is a leading sin. A coordinating sin, a coordinator's sin is a coordinating sin. Influential man, woman that commits sin publicly is influencing other people to commit sin. Public disobedience by leaders. Is teaching all the younger people in the church to do the same. Whosoever shall break one of the least of these commandments and shall teach men so by your wrong negative influence. Will be counted the least in the kingdom of God. You'll be so far away from the kingdom that those who look at you will see that are so small diminished least and you are excluded from the kingdom but whosoever shall do and teach your heart is filled with the word your heart is influenced by the word of god your conviction is raised up and lifted up again so the standard of the word of God, you are careful where you go. You are careful how you talk. You are careful how you dress. You are careful how you behave. Because you know, whatever you do is teaching other people so. And whosoever shall do and teach these commandments of God. He delights in this word of God. He loves this word of God. It breaks his heart. When people do not keep the word of God, whosoever shall do and teach these commandments of God, he shall be called great in the kingdom. And the Lord brought a little infant, a little child. And he said, except you humble yourself, except you become converted, and then you become that this little child. Are you like that little child? In your heart? In your soul? In your mind? Or have you become so familiar with the word of God? God, you're not like the little child anymore, but whosoever shall be converted and become as this little child, trembling at the word of God, submissive to the word of God, convicted by the word of God, obedient to the word of God, not claiming to know it all, not claiming to have gone through that study before not claiming to be an exalted leader and teacher himself not claiming to be an exalted man or woman in the church himself herself but you are converted and then you become as one of these little children those are the people that will be great in the kingdom of god the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The kingdom of God is not partying. It's not celebrating. The kingdom of God is not frivolity. The kingdom of God is not dancing and kissing. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Do you have that righteousness? Inward righteousness, heart righteousness, deep righteousness. Do you have it? Or is it this superficial, shallow thing? I don't use jewelry. 
I don't wear beards. I comb my head. I don't choose what they dress. Is that all? Is that all? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. The kingdom of God is not just celebration. Just gathering, just assembly. The kingdom of God is not position. The kingdom of God is not title. The kingdom of God is not what title you bear, what work you do in the church. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Not the joy of drunkards. Not the joy of careless people. Not the joy of theater people who dramatize. Not the joy of hypocrites. The joy in the Holy Ghost. That's the kingdom of God. And the Lord wants us to have this deep righteousness. Because except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth, he that doeth, he that doeth, the will of my Father who is in heaven. Do you do it? Do you teach it? Or do you teach it without doing it? Do you teach righteousness so forcefully without doing it faithfully? Do you try to command, control other people? But your own heart is not under control. Your life is not under control. Don't just teach it. Do it first. Whosoever shall do and teach these commandments, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. It's impossible except you are born again. And except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the new birth will bring the new life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new. Can you say in your personal life that those old things are gone? Old behavior gone. Old ambition gone. Old lifestyle gone. If any man be in Christ, this is the evidence of being in Christ. A change of life. A change of heart. A change of behavior. A change of character. A change of lifestyle. That's what it means. To possess the righteousness. That will take us into the kingdom. And if you have heard a message like this and you are not born again, where will you spend eternity? How shall we escape? How shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, if you neglect so great 
word, what you are hearing. And you don't store it in your heart. And it doesn't affect your mind, your heart, your will, your spirit, your attitude. If it does not affect you through and through, what hope will you have? Should the Lord call you out of this world suddenly? What you have now, the surface, superficial, external righteousness, where will it take you to? When the rapture will take place, the kind of righteousness that will take us to heaven, rapturable people, that will be the righteousness of the saints. Possess it, demonstrate it, live it out, and let your neighbors be influenced by that kind of righteousness. Whosoever shall do and teach these commandments shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven.